I hate rules myself, but we gotta do this today. <laughs> Mr. Wood, he has 15 minutes for his rebuttal. Ready? At the end of my opening statement, I said that there are two basic approaches Muslims can take when Muhammad is criticized. One, they can reject early historical material, and two, they can commit what's called the two-quoque fallacy. Again, the two, you commit the two-quoque fallacy when instead of actually answering an objection, you say, well, you've got that problem. Um, for instance, if my wife says, David, you're mean, and I say, well, you've been mean too, uh, that's a fallacy. It's it doesn't answer the objection. Now, we've seen that Ali takes both of these approaches. He says uh, he rejects embarrassing material about Muhammad, and he repeatedly commits uh, the two quoque fallacy. Let me respond briefly to his comments about, uh, about the early sources. Um, Ali argues that Ibn Ishaq shouldn't be used as a historical source. I find this pretty interesting since Ibn Ishaq is our earliest detailed biography of the life of Muhammad. But let's look at Ali's reasons for rejecting it. Um, he says that it doesn't contain a reliable isnad or chain of transmission. But this is just a misunderstanding on Ali's part. The chain of transmission didn't really become important until the 9th century when uh, these theological disputes arose and uh, people like Al Bukhari and Imam Muslim wanted to go back and try and find uh, which uh, collections were reliable. And so they came up with a method that you, you go for the chain of transmission. But Ibn Ishaq was written a century earlier before that became important, so Ali's criticism is really that this material is so early that it arose before the chain of transmission became uh, necessary. Ali says that Ibn Ishaq incorporated material from Jewish sources. That's true, but there are four problems with this response. One, Ibn Ishaq incorporated material from Jewish sources that he considered reliable. Two, Jews know how to write history too. Three, if you want to say that Muslims shouldn't use Jewish material, you're contradicting Muhammad, who told his followers to gather reliable information from the Jews. And four, the material I'm using didn't come from Jewish sources, and so the entire objection is irrelevant. Um, Ali says that it's apocryphal. Well, I, it's not canonical. Well, I'm not interested in canonical. I'm interested in historical. And Ibn Ishaq is our earliest detailed source on Muhammad. Ali asks, how would Christians like it if he went to the, the infancy gospel of Thomas? Let's be clear here. Me going to your earliest detailed biography of Muhammad is nothing like you going to the last worst information about Jesus. Those, those, uh, those situations aren't similar. Um, let's move on to the satanic verses. Um, Ali, had, well, first, Ali has painted a, a, a beautiful picture of Muhammad with, those, uh, with uh, all those references. The problem is, Ali is very selective in the details that, uh, that he shares. Some people call this the Walt Disney version of, uh, of Muhammad. And, uh, well, it's not going to work in a debate. Here's why. Uh, let's suppose I'm thinking of a man named John Gacy. Um, he entertained children at birthday parties. He held neighborhood bar barbecues regularly. He... Um, he, he helped people, he, helped, he worked with local charities, he worked with youth organizations like the JCs and the Boy Scouts, he helped all kinds of people, he helped young people find jobs. And I could list, I could go through and show all these wonderful things about John Gacy, but if I want to say he's a great man, I can't leave out the fact that he raped and killed 30 boys. Those things are important, and if you want the complete picture, uh, you have to go to all the details, not just the good things. If we just go to the good things, we can make anyone in the entire world look good. Um, now let's review some of the facts. The Satanic Verses, um, Ali says that uh, it's only in Ibn Ishaq and that it's a total fabrication. Let's look at his, uh, let's look at his objections real quick. I argue that the Satanic Verses cast doubt on the reliability of Muhammad since he couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. Uh, again, Ali argued that it's a forgery. Um, Ali criticizes the count because it says that there were Muslims in Abyssinia, but Ali is just wrong here. In, in the year 614 to 615, a group of 11 male Muslims and four female Muslims moved to Abyssinia to escape persecution. This is a fact of history. Ali criticizes the account. Um, he says that because it has the, the phrase, have you not heard, that uh, this can only refer to something bad, um, the object. Well, I'll quote you the Quran. Oh, my people. Have you not considered, if I have a clear proof from my Lord, have you not considered, it's the same Arabic phrase, and it says, clear proof from your Lord. Is this saying something derogatory about clear proof from God? No. And I could give you some other verses if you want. So this objection just doesn't work. Now, Ali has given his case against the satanic verses, and both of his objections are simply wrong. 
Um, and also the objection that I'm only getting this from Ibn Ishaq, let me give you my case for the Satanic verses. Um, if you want sources, we read about the Satanic verses in 1. Ibn Ishaq, 2. Ibn Sa'd, 3. Al-Tabari, 4. Ibn Abi Hatim, 5. Ibn Al-Mundir, 6. Ibn Mardoya, 7. Musa Ibn Uqba, and 8. Abu Mashar. According to Abu Mashar, by the way, the chain of transmission does establish that this story is authentic. Ali says that the satanic verses aren't mentioned in the hadith. This is false. Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 6, number 385, confirms the event. We don't get all the details, but al-Bukhari tells us that when Muhammad revealed Surah 53, all of the polytheists bowed down in honor of the revelation. Now, why would polytheists bow down in honor of Surah 53? Well, the other sources tell us. When Muhammad told people that praying to Allah, Alusa, and Manat is okay, the polytheists bowed down. That's in the sources, and it fits together perfectly. And let's not forget that a couple of verses of the Quran were a reaction to this entire incident. So uh, I think the, the satanic verses is pretty well established, and I've given eight sources plus um, confirmation in al-Bukhari, the Muslim's most trusted um, material on the life of Muhammad. So if Ali wants us to reject it, he's going to have to present a better case against it. And I've shown that his arguments so far are wrong. But what about Muhammad's other spiritual issues? I said that Muhammad's first impression of his revelations was that he was demon-possessed. Ali admits that Muhammad originally thought that he was demon-possessed. He says that this shows that Muhammad was humble. Uh, yeah, but it also shows that whatever Muhammad saw in that cave, he thought it was a demon. And how am I supposed to have complete confidence so many years later that this was really the angel Gabriel when Muhammad's first impression was that it was a demon? Um, Ali says that people thought Jesus was demon-possessed. Here we see the two quoque fallacy again, but even so, it misses the point. I'm not saying, hey, some people thought that Muhammad was demon-possessed. I'm saying that Muhammad thought Muhammad was demon-possessed, and there's a difference there. Um, I said in my opening statement that Muhammad's revelations made him depressed and suicidal. Ali says this never happened. Well, uh, it's in al-Bukhari. That's your most trusted collection. Um, it's also in Ibn Ishaq, that's our earliest biography, and in Al-Tabari, so uh, I don't have any re reason to reject this. I pointed out that Muhammad was the victim of a magic spell. The spell made Muhammad think that he had had sex with his wives when he really hadn't. Um, I don't recall an answer, but if, if you did, uh, uh, I'll get to that later. So the question of Muhammad's spiritual reliability is still a huge problem, and, and what are we supposed to make of this? Uh, Ali expects us to look at all the historical evidence and say, yes, Muhammad thought he was demon-possessed, Yes, it looks like he became suicidal according to the evidence. Yes, the evidence says he delivered revelations from Satan. Yes, people could cast spells on him, but he's still completely reliable. And I'm not willing to make that move. Next, I argued that Muhammad was not a man of peace. I pointed, one, to Muhammad's assassinations and executions, two, to his torture of Kanana, and three, to the fact that Muhammad allowed his men to have sex with their female captives, which in the modern world would qualify uh, as war crimes, even though it's in the Quran. Ali says that this is just a smokescreen. Really? Muslims tell me that Muhammad was a gentle prophet of peace. I go to your earliest sources, and it doesn't matter which sources you go to, there's plenty of material there. I go to Ibn Ishaq because it's the earliest, that's why I go there. Um, and I go there and I find uh, Muhammad ordering his followers to assassinate men and women who insulted him, who wrote poetry against him. I find people being brutally tortured. I find Muhammad telling his followers that it's okay to have sex with female captives. Uh, Ali says this never happened. Well, I've got uh, four pages of references here from the Quran, from Sahih al-Bukhari, from Sahih Muslim, and from other uh, of your most reliable sources saying, yes, it did. Um, <clears throat> Ali says that Muhammad was violent because he was head of state. Uh, we need to be realistic here. Muhammad was ordering his followers to sneak into people's houses and assassinate them. Is that part of his job description? Muhammad was killing people during caravan raids. What does this have to do with being head of state? Muhammad sent assassins to Mecca. He wasn't head of state there. When Muhammad took Mecca, several people were executed for insulting him years earlier before he had any political power at all. So they weren't guilty of any crimes against the state. And what do you do with a man who was executed simply for saying that he would never become a Muslim? Um, Ali says that Muhammad was, was gentle. Uh, I'm not, that's probably the last word I'd, res, uh, I'd, uh, I'd apply to Muhammad for some of these things. Um, I'll give you an example. If you don't like Ibn Ishaq, uh, here's one from uh, al-Bukhari. This is interesting because Ali claims again that Muhammad was gentle. Eight men once came to Medina. They converted to Islam, but they got sick, so Muhammad told them to go drink some camel's urine. And they did, and apparently they felt better. But then they left Islam, and they killed Muhammad's shepherd. 
And uh, guess what the, the peaceful, gentle prophet did when he caught these men? Now, they were guilty of murder, okay. And guess what he did? He tied them up, he had them tied up, he had their hands and feet cut off, he burned their eyeballs out with hot nails, and then he left them in the hot sun to die of thirst. Now, I'm willing to lay this down as a rule. If you burn out people's eyeballs with hot nails, you're not gentle. You want to know who's gentle? Mr. Rogers was gentle. Not, not, <laughs> no burning people's eyes out. Ali says, Muhammad never sought revenge. Well, you can say that. I'm going to your early sources and I see something different. Um, he says, Muhammad was just a king. His circumstances changed. Yes, he went from being in Mecca where he couldn't possibly have won a fight to going to Medina where he could win a fight. So you can't look at the Meccan period and say he was peaceful because he didn't fight. Uh, that could just mean he's smart enough to realize, hey, I better not fight because I'm going to lose. So uh, that's not very good evidence that, that he was peaceful. Next, I pointed out that Surah 4.3 tells Muslims that they can have up to four wives, um, but that Muhammad had a lot more than four wives. Uh, Ali responded to um, the issue of polygamy. I didn't criticize Muhammad for polygamy. Um, I criticized him here because he told his followers that they were allowed to have four wives and then he had more. So this was really an inconsistency and I said that it looks pretty suspicious when he received the revelation saying that he could have more. Um, <clears throat> uh, as far as Aisha, I brought up the issue of Muhammad's uh, uh, nine-year-old wife Aisha. I said that the greatest moral example in history probably shouldn't be having sex with a nine-year-old girl. Al Ali quoted the Jewish Talmud written more than 2,000 years after the Old Testament, and then once he built his argument saying, well, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, well, the Old Testament allowed men to have sex with girls as young as three. That doesn't come from the Old Testament. Show me that one in the Old Testament. That comes from the Talmud. That was over 2,000 years later. No, no Christian in the world believes that Jesus inspired the Talmud. Um, <clears throat> as far as arguments for Islam, I argued that there's no good evidence for Islam. Ali responded to... Uh, the criticisms I drew from the Hadith, most of the ones I drew were from the Quran. Uh, yes, in my writings I do say it doesn't rule out a prophet, but I'm not using this material to rule out Muhammad as a prophet. I'm not saying he said false things. I wouldn't even, as far as I'm concerned, I don't even care if there's something in the Quran. I wouldn't rule him out as a prophet because of this. I mean, he's writing in the seventh century. I don't think all prophets had to have modern scientific views. I was using this material to respond to the Muslim scientific argument. The argument that says, we know Muhammad was a prophet because of his scientific accuracy. And I'm saying, if that's your argument, if you're making scientific accuracy the criterion for truth, then you've got a problem because you have all these passages in the Hadith and all these passages in the Quran. And I, I, I already said that you can reinterpret them. The point is, um, non-Muslims aren't going to reinterpret them. If, if, if the Quran says, uh, Alexander the Great got to the place where the sun sets and it sets in a pool of murky water or if it says that stars are missiles that God uses to hurl at demons and when you see a shooting star it's because God hurled a, hurled a star at a demon um, when, we see, when we see things like this again you can reinterpret them but it makes it difficult to accept the argument um, I argued uh, uh, I responded to the argument from literary excellence Ali didn't respond um, biblical prophecies um, he, he points out that there are uh, names and words that look like Muhammad, well, uh, I mean, think about how this works. I mean, my name's David Wood. If I want, you know, think about an English Bible, I can find David and Wood all over the Bible. Um, you could find a prophecy of anyone. I mean, think, George Bush, could you find a prophecy about... God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. This is a clear <laughs> prophecy that, that God's mode of revelation to the world was through a bush. So, and who could this be? It's a clear prophecy of George Bush. Um, I don't think that's a good prophecy. Um, but actually, the entire argument, the entire argument from biblical prophecies is pretty easy to refute. Because Ali believes that Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18 predicts the coming of a prophet after Moses. I agree. But by granting Deuteronomy 18, Ali has just ruined his case for biblical prophecies. Verse 18 says that God will raise up a prophet like Moses. Unfortunately, just two verses later we read this. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So we see two things here. One, if a prophet says something that I have not commanded him to say. Or two, if he speaks in the name of other gods, he's not a prophet. 
Muhammad did both when he revealed the satanic verses. Ali says it never happened. I gave eight sources plus al-Bukhari's confirmation. So according to history, this really did happen. And according to this passage, which Ali grants is inspired by God, Muhammad cannot possibly be a prophet. And so I would say that, that we're all amply re, uh, uh, justified in rejecting Muhammad a prophet, especially if you believe in the Bible. Time's up. Thank you, Mr. Wood. We have time now. You have 15 minutes for your rebuttal. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I did point out uh, that the satanic versus story is mentioned by Ibn Ishaq at Tabari. This is true, but why were they writing? You have to look at their intention. At Tabari actually wrote an introduction as to why he wrote. And he basically says in there that he took as many traditions as he could lay his hands upon without expressing an opinion about the reliability because these men are not scholars. This is how, this is how his history was recorded by the early Muslim historians. They took whatever information they could without, ju without, without uh, deeming a, 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 a judgment upon them because they didn't have the prerequisite knowledge. The satanic versus story is not taken seriously by any Muslim scholar of hadith. It's not because they're embarrassed by it. No, it's because it's not reliable. It's not reliable at all. He said the original part of Surah Najm had this thing about the satanic verses. Where is that version of the Quran? Where is it? It's gone. And in the story itself, it says, it says in the satanic verses story that the people from Abyssinia started to come back into Mecca. That's what it says. This is historically inaccurate. The Muslims were living under sanctions at the time. This is a fact. Now I want to talk about the, the polygamy issue here, uh, uh, especially about the marriage with Aisha. Now you have to understand, when the Prophet was 25 years old, he married Khadija, who was a 40-year-old woman at the time. And he stayed married to her and her alone for the next 23 years until his death three or four years later. And then he married a series of 11 women uh, in his, when he was well into his 50s, and all from different tribes. Now I ask you, is this the action of a lust addict or a master strategist? In the full bloom of his youth, he has one wife and she's 15 years older than he is. But in his old age, he has many wives. You see, they were all from different tribes. He was able to peacefully reconcile the entire Arabian Peninsula based on his marriages. They had a common relative now. It was a kinship between them. We need to take our minds out of the gutters. This is why he had more than four wives, you see, because he is a prophet and the duty of a prophet is to take the message to the people. He's exceptional in many ways. He had to pray six times a day. He had to pray to Hajjid. That's only for him. Pray six, who wants to do another prayer? But he did it out of, raw, out of awe and reverence for his Lord. He was not allowed to receive charity. That's only for him. This only for thee and not the believers at large. He's exceptional in many ways. There's no lust motive here. Again, Mr. Wood is looking at things with, uh, through his own kind of mentality of the Bible because the Bible goes into these things and he looks at things at surface level so on and so forth you know raiding the caravan right when did this happen in the early early Medinan period why because Abu Sufyan who was in Mecca he was taking the Muslim possessions in Mecca because the Muslims were kicked out of Mecca and the majority of their possessions were left in Mecca so he was taking their possessions going to Syria and trading with them over there their own possessions and this was a time of war this was a time of, this was, this, the, the Muslims were now allowed to physically defend themselves. This, these were their own possessions, right? Now, uh, as far as, uh, what else did he bring up here? Um, uh, so, okay, the marriage with Aisha. Now, in Semitic and Middle Eastern culture, even unto this day, you know, forget 1400 years ago. My own grandmother, 60 years ago in Iran, got married at 13 years old. In this culture, puberty is a sign of teenage rebellion. Right? Is this progression? In 1889, in this state, California, the legal age of consent was 10 years old. In Hawaii in 2001, it was 14. A man can go to Hawaii, marry a girl, right, a woman, and then cross the Pacific into California, and suddenly he's a pedophile. You see, American children today, one third are obese, and they're addicted to television and internet pornography. Mr. Uh, Wood's uh, uh, argument is completely anachronistic. Aisha was given away by her parents to the Prophet, who married her lawfully and consummated the marriage after she began her menstrual cycle, a God-given natural sign of adulthood. And Mr. Wood likes to present Aisha like she's a secret, no one knows. My own daughter's name is Aisha. It's one of those popular Muslim names in the world. This was a saintly woman whose intellect and maturity cannot be found in the world today. You know, she was playing with dolls. No, it actually says that after she gave up playing with dolls, that's when she became an adult. So what if she was playing with dolls? My mother has a Beanie Baby collection. She's, she's the most, she's, 
the most intelligent woman I know. I have baseball cards. I have a Barry Bonds rookie. He was a lot smaller back then. So what? 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 what what's, what's with this woman? She was the only wife who had not been married before. This does not fit the psychological profile of a pedophile. Besides, uh, a, a girl or a person who, a child who is sexually molested, they become very introvert and, and possibly self-destructive later on in their lives. Was well, Aisha like this? Certainly not. Why did the prophet marry her? Because he knew as a prophet, several decades after his death, she would become an imminent teacher who expounded first-hand knowledge of the prophet's life and example. Thousands of hadith come from her. Thousands of hadith. She was a genius. One time an Iranian Christian asked me, an Iranian Christian, why did, why did your prophet marry such a young girl, a child bride? Right? I said, you know who else married a child bride? Joseph the carpenter. Joseph, I mean, we have to look at things equally, balanced. We can't say, oh, forget about what the Christians are saying, you know. Let's just see what, let's just look at Islam for a minute here. No, read your own sources. How old was uh, Mary when she was impregnated by the Holy Ghost? Twelve years old. She was married to Joseph the carpenter at the time. I mean, look at the New Advent Encyclopedia, the commentary of the Oxford Dictionary Bible. Read the Proto-Gospel of James. Matthew says, before they came together, uh, uh, you know, before they came together, she was found impregnated by the Holy Ghost. Right? Before they came together to do what? Play Monopoly? Play with dolls? Before they came together sexually, she was found impregnated by the Holy Ghost. Why didn't Joseph consummate the marriage? Because she was still a child at the time. You have to wait till you reach puberty. But as soon as she did, the Annunciation of Christ came. Now, Mr. Wood says in his online writings, what do you think of a prophet who has intercourse with a nine-year-old girl? This is an atheist argument. Mr. Wood is coming from the background of an atheist. This is not a Christian argument. Because an atheist would also say, what do you think of a God who decides to enter into the world through the birth canal of a 12-year-old virgin? Hmm, that sounds suspect. What kind of God is that? Why would he do that? Ugh, I don't know about that religion. If Mr. Wood is going to argue that the Holy Prophet Muhammad was immoral, then he has conceded that the Holy Spirit was immoral because he impregnated Mary at 12 years old. And I must remind Mr. Wood that according to his own Gospels, slander against the Holy Spirit is an unforgivable sin. Now, I, wanna, I wanted to go into the biblical criteria for prophethood, but Mr. Wood has brought up so many points here, I'm going to bypass that get into some of uh, what he was saying here. You know, the, the Quranic scientific errors. The sun was setting in a pool of murky water, right? What does the verse actually say? Dul Qurnayn, the man with two horns. It doesn't mean the devil, right? If you look at ancient Macedonian coins, Alexander the Great's likeness is shown with two horns, his dominion over the east and the west. The, the town of Lichnis was annexed to Macedonia. During his time, this was the extreme west of his empire. The verse says he saw the sun. He perceived the sun setting in a, in a pool of murky water. Right? Now, in this town, to the west of the town, is a huge lake, 170 square miles, fed by underground springs through limestone rocks that issue extremely murky water. Right? Looking at the, looking at the lake from the town, the observer would seem to see the sun setting in a pool of murky water. Right? But what does the Quran actually say, though? That was his perception. Alexander the Great, Dhul Qurnayn. The Quran says, Kullun fi falaki yasbahun, regarding the planets. All of the celestial bodies, Kullun is in the plural, not in the duo. Plural. It's, just, it's not just talking about the sun and the moon. Plural, all of the, the stars, the planets, all of them. Kullun fi falaki yasbahun. Falak means to coil or orbit. Yasbahun means uh, a, a, a motion from the, from the object in question. Swim is not a right a word. Revolve is the correct translation. According to Dr. Maurice Bukai, well, I have the book there, The Bible, the Quran, and Modern Science. This was a man who studied the Bible and the Quran objectively, and he converted to Islam in the process. He says the Quran doesn't make a single scientific blunder. What about the Bible? Does it make any scientific errors? It says in Genesis chapter 30 that Jacob took, took rods of striped wood and put it in a watering trough and had some, an some animals look at them while they were mating. And then when their young was born, they had striped fur. In other words, whatever you're looking at, when you're, during conception, will determine the physical characteristics of your offspring. So if a man is having intercourse with his wife and he's watching Barney the Big Purple Dinosaur, <laughs> his son will be born purple and have a long tail. The Bible says that the earth is 5,768 years old. Look at the genealogy of Luke. He, he mentions all of the patriarchs from the creation of Adam all the way to Jesus. Add 2,007 years. You get 5,768 years. And this is what Christians believed for centuries. This is what they believed. And then they found dinosaur bo bones and they performed radiocarbon-14 dating on them. And how old are they? About 65 million years old. 
I, well, I think we forgot to, call, to, to carry the one over. I think that we put the decimal place. And there's actually a Christian uh, apologist like Jack T. Chick who will actually argue that dinosaurs and human beings once lived in perfect peace and harmony on the earth. That's not science. That's called the Flintstones. <laughs> now, um, he says, you can have you know, uh, uh, sex with captives. I want to quote you. Uh, um, let's see here. Okay. If you see a beautiful woman, I'm going to quote you a verse from scripture. If you see a beautiful woman amongst the captives, take her home and shave her head. After a month, you can have conjugal rights with her. That's what the verse says in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Again, this is Jesus, the old God of the Old Testament, is telling the Jews this law, but Mr. Wood finds fault in it. Why? Why does he find fault in it? Because, you know, it doesn't make sense to our new enlightened society. This was an ancient law. What he didn't mention, this was a biblical time. This was actually good for them. Men and women without men were sitting ducks for, marauder, for marauders and gangs. They were sitting ducks. And then he mentioned the story of Bani al-Mustalik. What he doesn't mention, what he didn't mention, however, is that when the prophet defeated them, he married, and all of these were defensive campaigns. He was constantly under attack in Medina. Constantly under attack. These were in, de in defense. Now, when he defeated them, he married uh, one of their women, Umm al-Mu'mineen Juwariya radiallahu anha. He asked for her father in marriage. His, he asked her father. And when the Sahaba, the companions, noticed that the Bani al-Mustaliq were now kin to the Prophet, over 100 families were released from captivity. This was an, a benevolent act on his part. A benevolent act. Um, now, Sharia does allow a man to have conjugal rights with his female captives if it is consensual. This is an ancient law. It ain't a biblical law. It has no application in the world today. You can't apply this today. This is an ancient law. Now, rape, however, is absolutely forbidden in any context. It's a capital offense. The Quran is very clear about that. Um, he also, uh, let's see, what else did he, what did he mention here? <clears throat> oh, the Jews, the killing of the Jews. Now, he's saying, you know, the, when the prophet went to Medina, uh, he took it personal because the Jews didn't accept his message, so he just started to kill them. If you... <laughs> Nothing is further from the truth. The first thing he did when he got to Medina, the very first act he did was sign a treaty, a peace treaty, with all of the Jews of the Oasis. They all signed the treaty, in which he stipulated, and I'll quote it to you, the Jews shall maintain their own religion and the Muslim theirs. Loyalty is a protection against treachery. All three Jewish tribes signed the treaty. All three Jewish tribes broke the treaty. The first two Jewish tribes were exiled north, the Khaybar. The, second Jewish, the third Jewish tribe, the Bani Qureda, they attempted several times to assassinate the Prophet and they broke their treaty. During the siege, when 10,000 people stormed the oasis, they broke their treaty with the Prophet. They were guilty of treason. They were guilty of treason. In times of martial law in the civilized world, if you commit treason, it, you'll, they'll kill you. So these men, only the men, and this is, this is interesting because the Prophet judged them according to their own law. Their own law says, quote, Deuteronomy 20, it states that a far off city guilty of treason will have its men executed and women ch and, and children taken into captivity. But if the city is of these nations, save alive nothing that breathes. Deuteronomy chapter 20, revealed by Jesus Christ according to David Wood, the God of the Old Testament. Right? Now suddenly in the, in the New Testament he has a change of heart. Love your enemy, turn the other cheek, so on and so forth. So, you know, Marcion had a point about that. So according to their own, he judged them according to, the, according to their own law, they deserve total annihilation. But he judged, he judged them by the more merciful one. And the chief of the Bani Qureda, Ka'ab ibn Asad, he actually commented before he was uh, executed, you Muslims were just with us. You Muslims were just with us. I mean, Mr. Wood, again, is, is setting up a smokescreen. He's ignoring, he's ignoring the vast majority of the Prophet's uh, uh, existence in this world as a mercy unto all mankind. You know, 99% of what people have said about him, his enemies included, and he's concentrating as one little percent of, you know, some, some uh, uh, Jewish man said this, a hypocrite said that, so on and so forth. I mean, it's, it's not being balanced. Again, we have a, a breach of balance. Um, what else did he say? Oh, the star. A oh, uh, star is a shooting, uh, uh, it's, it's aimed at a demon. How does Mr. Wood know this is not true? Can he see demons and angels? You know what says the book of Matthew? It says the Magi, these Zoroastrian priests from my country of Iran, they came into Bethlehem following a star. It was hovering over a, over a stable. You know how big a star is? How is this possible? 
But that's perfectly scientifically acceptable to Mr. Wood. But a, a shooting star after a demon, I can't accept that. A demon he can't even see. Unless he can see demons. I don't know. Um, but I'm running out of time here. And he said, uh, so, um, so we have to look at sound sources. Right? We have to look at sound sources. Now again, going back to the Satanic Verses story. There is something about Satanic Verses in Sahih Bukhari. It doesn't mention, however, that these verses were revealed. It just says, like he said, that the unbelievers, they, they made sajda. They prostrated at the end of the recitation because they were moved by the words of the Quran. It doesn't mention at all that he, he, was, uh, he made up these verses or he listened to Satan or anything like that. There's no details given in Sahih Bukhari. This is only an Ibn Ishaq, a historical source that came after these works like Kitab al Athar, uh, uh, the Muwatta. I'm out of time. I'm sorry. Salam alaikum. Thank you, Mr. Kai. Now, Mr. Wood will begin round three by posing a question to the side, and he'll have even if you respond to it. This will go on.